everyone. Uh, let's start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, whatever your coordinates are. Welcome to day two of the Stanford Compression Workshop. Hope you all had a pleasant and enriching day one. I trust you would agree with me that we had a fantastic set of researchers and speakers with us yesterday, and all of them have enlightened us with their knowledge and experience. Don't worry if you miss day one. We have a spectacular set of speakers for you on day two as well. The first session of the day will be around the general theme of compression and its application to neural nets. We'll kickstart our day with Dr. Sarah Hooker. Dr. Hooker is a researcher at Google Brain working on training models that fulfill multiple desiderata. Her main research interests gravitate towards interpretability, model compression, and security. In 2014, she founded Delta Analytics, a nonprofit dedicated to bringing technical capacity to help nonprofits across the world use machine learning for good. Today, Dr. Hooker will question the myth of the perfect model and shower us with her insights. On to you, Dr. Hooker. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so we have full functionality. I was just saying, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. It's lovely to be here. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm not, a, in fact, a doctor, but it's lovely to be given that illustrious title. I've taken a more rogue career path. Um, but today I will be talking about some of my research. And I, I think um, in many ways, what's fun about this talk is that it touches upon many of the areas I do research in. A lot of my research is focused on how do we train models beyond tested accuracy to fulfill multiple criteria? And what I'll talk about today is really the intersection of these criteria. When we optimize for one, do we uh, induce trade-offs with others? Um, I have a few ideas I wanted to put together. And as I was putting together the slides yesterday, um, I'm not quite sure we'll get to all of them, but that's kind of the fun part of talks like this. So uh, broadly, what I'd like to cover is firstly this intriguing relationship between capacity and generalization. But then secondly, this myth that uh, is perpetuated to a large degree in literature today that we're optimizing for these properties in isolation. Um, and then I'd like to conclude in a kind of open frontiers note, which is by articulating some of these trade-offs, there's very promising work on achieving better trade-offs. Um, and I'll of course be mentioning research done with my colleagues at Google Brain. Um, so let's get started. Um, so really my interest in compression started from uh, three charts. <laughs> Uh, but firstly, it's important to characterize the landscape that this has taken place on, which is that we have um, a bigger is better mentality uh, currently in the number of model parameters. Um, and uh, this is because throwing parameters at a problem has proved to be annoyingly effective <laughs> at gaining uh, more performance. And what I mean by that is that we've kind of uh, seen this explosion from Lynette in the 1990s at 60,000 weights to uh, supervision in 2012. And some of this is explained by the dimensionality of the problem. So we've gone from MNIST, which is this 28 by 28 black and white image, uh, to far uh, higher complexity with something like ImageNet, which is typically uh, uh, far 224 by 224 by three. Um, but even when we control for the same data set, uh, we uh, have seen an explosion in the number of parameters. And um, this is not domain specific as well. We see it in language. Um, and uh, why I, I, I said uh, this annoying uh, relationship, it's because in many ways, the relationship between weights and generalization properties is not well understood. And what I mean by that is that when I talked about these three charts that first got me interested in compression, 
The first is that there's very quickly diminishing returns to adding parameters. So we need to add millions of parameters to eke out additional gains. Um, for example, if you look at Inception v3 versus Inception v4, we essentially double the amount of parameters. So we go from 21 million to 41 million, but our test set accuracy only increases by 2%. Um, and uh, there are many redundancies between these weights. So uh, work has shown that a small set of weights can be used to predict 95% of the weights in the network. So we have a highly correlated weight space. Um, and of course, we also have this puzzling ability to remove the majority of these weights with minimal impact on test set accuracy. So this is work done with my colleagues, and we show that you can remove 90% of the weights and only lose 3% of performance. Um, even when you do it, uh, we, the yellow bar that you're seeing is just doing it at random. <laughs> so you can actually remove 90% of your weights at random and still end up um, over 60%, 65% of performance on ImageNet with a ResNet 50. And this prompts the question, and really it's the question that will drive this presentation, which is how can parameters with these radically different structures and similar top line metrics um, have this comparable generalization performance? Um, so even if we take a less severe aspect of compression, if we go from 0% pruning to 50%, we see an almost negligible decrease in, in top line performance. And um, one possibility is that test set accuracy is not a precise enough measure to capture how pruning impacts the generalization properties of the model. Uh, and that we need to go beyond test, test set accuracy to articulate these trade-offs. And why is this interesting? So why do we care about this? Uh, there are theoretical reasons why we care. So it, can we do better? Uh, this appears to be a very inefficient representation. So the need for so many extra parameters suggests that uh, perhaps by understanding more how these parameters have been used, we can arrive at a more efficient treatment. Um, and then the second, uh, which I actually think Jonathan is going to talk about a lot in the next talk, is if most of these weights are redundant, why do we need them in the first place? Can we train a smaller model from scratch to arrive at the same accuracy? Um, and I, I, I await plenty of interesting insights uh, in the next talk following this. Um, there are also practical reasons why it makes sense to understand you know, how all this capacity is being used. So the reason why many of us are here at this workshop is because uh, we care about compression as it relates to democratizing access to these models and making machine learning work in many different resource constrained environments. Um, and that's because there's benefits to compress models. So. Uh, we have a high preservation of top one accuracy, but that also uh, reduces the latency um, and also reduces the power usage, portability, et cetera. So um, the starting point and, and perhaps what is difficult is that largely to date, what we've talked about in terms of uh, compression literature has been uh, essentially minimizing some notion of compactness so um, or capacity. So that could be the number of weights or the number of neurons um, for a given budget of test set accuracy. But this presumes that all other properties are held static at the same time. And in fact, in complicated systems, it's very hard to vary one variable in isolation and foresee all these applica uh, implications. Um, so this is uh, the uh, so-called uh, death curtain, uh, the dividing corridor between uh, East and West Germany uh, during the Cold War, and it was depopulated as a means to preserve the border. But uh, the unintended implication of that is that now it's one of the most biodiverse areas in Europe and many uh, rare species have been found. And uh, in many ways, this is capturing the dynamic I'm talking about, which is that there are many uh, unintended implications of the choices that we make when we optimize for one property. And we often want models to fulfill multiple properties. So um, we'll talk today about model compression, robustness, and uh, 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 both robustness in the sense of distribution shift that's more natural in the real world, as well as uh, algorithmic bias. Um, and uh, one thing is that we'll get at is that this 
optimizing for one property and like compactness will entail trade-offs with others. So what do we ask? We ask firstly, how does model behavior diverge as we vary the level of compression? Um, so uh, robustness is one, but also if we go beyond our top line metric and we ask at a class and an exemplar level, uh, what do we see? Um, and uh, our experimental framework is to train populations of models at this different level of, of sparsity. So we have models that have no sparsity introduced all the way to um, the, the levels of sparsity that you would see in real world applications. So 80 plus in order to gain those benefits from um, the uh, in terms of latency. Um, and when I say sparsity of 90%, what I mean is that we've removed by the end of training 90% uh, of the weights. The model only has 10% of all weights that are active and contributing to the end uh, prediction. There's some nice properties to this empirical setup. So one is that we've controlled, because we're comparing models that are in a similar regime of performance, uh, we are asking, given similar regime, uh, how, how, do, how do the generalization properties differ? And that's important because we don't want to compare a model which is just bad at modeling the function, the, the data representation of all, and try and compare it to a model which is much better. So we're comparing within a similar band. But also, we can precisely vary how radically the weight representation differs by controlling the end sparsity. So we almost have this nice lever to understand how generalization properties differ as you exacerbate sparsity. And to keep you uh, not on your toes, <laughs> uh, I wanted to share the key results up front. So we do find that compressed models uh, have amplified sensitivity, um, but we also critically find that uh, compression disproportionately impacts a small subset of examples and classes. And what I'll talk about in the second part of this talk is why is a narrow part of the data distribution far more sensitive to varying capacity? So um, to begin with, let's think about the first. So establishing that pruning systematically impacts a small subset of classes and examples. Um, so for all these populations or models that we train, we look at, at a class level, uh, how does the population statistics diverge? And so we, for each class, we compute a two-tailed Welch independent t-test, and we ask, is this difference in population statistically significant? But then we also ask, where does predictive performance diverge most? What parts of the distribution do compressed models predict in a very different way from non-compressed? And we normalize our class level metric. And so what we end up asking is, did the class perform better or worse than expected, given the overall change to top one accuracy after pruning? And this is critical because it controls for any um, variation in top line performance and says, given that, is this model uh, disparately impact, is this class disparately impacted by the introduction of sparsity? And uh, what we find is that at every level of pruning we consider, a small subset of classes is systematically impacted. And the subset grows at high levels of pruning, meaning that we're seeing a monotonic increase in how these classes are impacted as we amplify the level of sparsity. Uh, and really what this is telling us is that the compressed model cannibalizes on a small subset of classes to preserve and actually sometimes even improve relative performance on others. So while the loss in generalization is far more concentrated than the relative gains, um, it, it really a few classes are bearing the brunt of the degradation caused by weight removal. We also uh, measure the sensitivity using uh, to 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 a distribution shift using uh, ImageNet A and ImageNet C. And ImageNet A is this collection of natural adversarial examples. So we have uh, a small set of 7,500 examples, uh, and ImageNet C is a set of corruptions applied to the ImageNet test set. And so for both, uh, what we are doing is uh, we at inference time, we're, we're, we're evaluating whether the compressed models are more sensitive than the non-compressed. 
And what we find is that uh, amplification of sensitivity to some perturbations is far more pronounced than others. But for all corruptions that we consider, uh, prune models are more sensitive. Um, so interestingly enough, sparse models are particularly sensitive to noise. Um, and we also find uh, that this pattern is uh, mirrored in, in treatment of Imagina A. So we also see this exacerbation um, of sensitivity when we consider uh, high levels of model sparsity. And you can see here the x-axis is the level of model, model sparsity. This kind of brings us to the main thing that I want to talk about today, which is why. So we've established that there is this disparate harm introduced by compression, but what makes certain parts of the distribution far more sensitive to compression? And um, to do that, we look at pruning identified exemplars. So these are examples where the predictive performance diverges uh, between these independently trained compressed and non-compressed models. And um, this is a good example. So this is ImageNet test set. Uh, and what is the true label of this image? This is actually a toilet seat. So, uh, and you can see uh, on the left, there's a non-pi example, and this is an example of a pi toilet seat. Um, and for this image, uh, the true label is actually espresso. <laughs> so again, we have the uh, we have a non-pi sample from the same class, um, and for this, it's maize, uh, wool. And matchstick. Uh, so what you probably gathered is that those were fairly atypical or um, outlier examples and you'd be right perhaps more challenging. So Pi is also more challenging for algorithms to classify. So uh, across all the data sets that we evaluated we plotted a sample of Pi, the whole test set and non-Pi and we show that on Pi which is the first bar you're seeing uh, the test and accuracy is much lower. Uh, and we also conducted a human study, and uh, this is where it gets interesting. So we find that pi is over index on two main groupings. One is noisy data points. So the data is improperly structured, uh, which corrupts information. It might be mislabeled. It might be severely corrupted, multi-object. And uh, this is a good example of what I mean by multi-object. So these are all uh, pi examples from ImageNet. And uh, it's interesting. So the true label of the first image, for example, is parallel bars. Um, and in fact, the non-prune, so the non-compressed, also predicts parallel bars. The prune predicts horizontal bars. And in fact, you can see horizontal bars in the image. Uh, the second one is my particular favorite uh, tension within ImageNet, which is you have corn as a class, but you also have ear of corn as a potential class. And ear of corn is just a part of the corn. So <laughs> very difficult to disentangle. Um, and uh, the third is uh, perhaps another example of this where two labels could be equally useful for a human. Um, and in fact, 59% of ImageNet pies are improperly structured for a single image classification task. It got to the point where as I, uh, as more and more of these images were surfaced by Pi, I even started uh, articulating some of my favorite tensions within ImageNet labeling. You have things like cradle or bassinet as two separate possible categories, desktop, computer screen, monitor, cup or coffee cup, missile or projectile. And uh, these are particular to ImageNet, but it's interesting to talk about because ImageNet has been part of how we do research for <laughs> close to a decade, uh, if not more. And uh, it means that a lot of what I mean by improperly structured for um, the data set, we've been treating it like a single image classification task and been penalizing models which don't succeed at the top label that we've assigned. However, in the treatment of the data itself, we've, we've not properly structured it for that task. Um, this is an example of a different notion of noisy, so corrupted or incorrectly labeled data. So, for example, the first is labeled restaurant, but there's no way you can see from that close-up of a plate that it's in fact a restaurant, uh, envelope and tub. Um, and what I would say is interesting about this group is that, in fact, it's kind of a misuse of parameters to represent these data points. It's, a, it's kind of bad memorization because, in fact, 
this data is not properly structured for the class. So forcing the model to learn it is the type of memorization that perhaps you do before a test where you don't really understand the true concepts. Um, there's also another group, which is atypical data points, so challenging examples. I think it's better to show these examples. Um, it will become more clear. But for example, uh, in the first one, we have a toilet seat, but it's outside. <laughs> uh, we have a bathtub, but it's filled with rocks. And then we have this, uh, I, it, it, we have this label plastic bag, but it's very far from notions of what we would think of as a plastic bag. And um, uh, for these very atypical examples, in many ways, uh, you could articulate and as growing research that it's a valuable use of parameters to represent these data points. It's a form of good memorization. We want the model to learn these very underrepresented features. Um, uh, what I have just shown is uh, a, a, a larger picture of what is actually being lost when you prune. So pi is a bit index on underrepresented attributes. Um, so this is a plot of the uh, percentage of, of, uh, of an attribute within pi versus the percentage of that attribute in the data set. Um, so low frequency attributes over index in pi. And what that means crucially is that we lose the long tail when we remove, and here I put 90%, but at any of these points, what we're doing is we're progressively losing treatment of the long tail. I want to reframe this finding because I think it's important to think of it in a different lens, which is that all these weights, this 90% of weights that we've been using to train these open parameterized models is being used to encode a useful representation of a small fraction of our data set, um, underrepresented features. And uh, that provides insight and framing for what has become a very popular recipe in our community, which is adding extra parameters to a problem. Uh, and it raises the question of, if most of these parameters are being used to encode a useful representation of, a, of the long tail, is this a problem solved more cheaply elsewhere? Uh, and, uh, in fact, several of our assumptions about deep neural networks are primitive. I could do another grumpy talk about that. <laughs> but for now, I, I will say that the one that is interesting is that we treat all these examples the same. Despite differences uh, that has been illustrated in our work in the capacity cost of learning a representation for each. Uh, in comparison, our brain is incredibly energy efficient by treating examples differently. We simulate much of what we see, we have specialized pathways for different modalities, and we have log scale vision, which impedes us from picking up on um, certain types of inputs. Um, and so how we treat this long tail as we model is not a trivial question. Most image and audio data sets follow zip distribution, so uh, very, very long, long tail. And how we how a model treats unrepresented features often coincides with notions of fairness. So for example, um, gender shades, very uh, important study which showed that models do far worse on underrepresented uh, uh, skin tones and gender skin tone combinations. Um, uh, there's work that shows geographic bias in how we collect our data sets. So some models perform far, far worse on locales undersampled in the training set. And so to look at this, we consider the Celeb A data set and the task of predicting blonde versus non-blonde. Uh, this is a toy task, but it helps illustrate the relationship between our notion of capacity and thinking about the relationship with algorithmic bias. In this data set, we have a spurious correlation between the target label and protected features. So um, in low frequency subgroups, uh, particularly it's very rare to find blonde, old, um, and these are labels given by Celeb A itself. Um, and we find that compression disproportionately impacts these underrepresented features, and that when this underrepresented feature is sensitive, pruning amplifies this algorithmic bias. Um, and this leads to how do we achieve a better trade-off? Um, so one role that was important in motivating this work is that it's actually very difficult in most cases where we want to audit potential uh, uh, disparate harm uh, to do so unless we have comprehensive labels. And that's rarely the case. 
Uh, and so in the absence, and it's really the case for a few reasons, we have high dimensional label uh, data sets, labeling is very expensive. It's hard to label all the proxy variables that are, uh, that are correlated. And then there's also additional legal obstacles, additional sensitivity. Um, and uh, Pi is a useful protocol for auditing what is the impact and for surfacing the examples that require additional um, auditing. Um, so at test time, it's unsupervised, and it's based upon a divergence in predictive behavior. But there's a broader theme, which is by articulating the trade-off, we also pave the way to achieve a better trade-off between compression and disparate impact. In many ways, this is an a very unsaturated direction, undersaturated, because to date we've only optimized for one aspect. But identifying and articulating what those trade offs are allow us to optimize it for explicitly. Uh, so, this is uh, work uh, from the University of Utah, and it's looking at if we constrain uh, explicitly the, the optimization function, how does that impact the level of pies? And can we achieve uh, better, uh, better notions of distribution of this harm? And they ch achieve very interesting results. And I, I think that this is one thing, which is a community uh, understanding uh, that there's more than one aspect that we're optimizing for paves a, a very exciting research path for uh, our problem and our task achieving the better trade-off that we want. Um, I want to stop because I definitely want to leave uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, and um, in, I, actually, perhaps I'll do that first. Let me open up for q and I know there's a Q&A box, and I can add more things if there's time, but uh, it looks like we already have two questions. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll tackle those, and then we can go from there. So Raheem says, what happens to Korean models in terms of loss landscape that is not able to classify pies? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know. Um, so, uh, so I guess there's a few ways of looking at this. So we do know in terms of our sub our uh, our sub metrics, so our class level and our image level performance. But there's an interesting idea as well of understanding what's happening in terms of characterizing the decision boundary. In general, characterizing the decision boundary in um, high dimensional landscapes is an open research question itself. Uh, my hypothesis is that as we prune and as we sparsify, we are losing what requires memorization. So uh, in many ways, we're, we're arriving at um, decision boundaries where anything that the model was uncertain about already um, that I had to memorize in order to learn a useful mapping is being lost. Um, how that's articulated, I feel like that's a really exciting research direction. Uh, so now we have three more, excellent. Please keep them coming. Uh, so uh, Tiago says, do you think that it will be practical to find an exact encoding of a trained neural network which requires fewer parameters? In other words, do you think something like lossless or exact compression can address such disparities amongst uh, different classes? So I'm not. I'm going to uh, try and guess at what this question means. I think what Tiago is saying: Will we ever be at the optimal? Will we ever not avoid these trade-offs? Um, and I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, we have a parametric model, which is essentially a frequency counter. Um, and uh, in many ways, we have to constrain the function to optimize for what our desirable properties are uh, given our task. And so there may be tasks where you may not have sensitive attributes or you may not have privacy considerations. And then you can emphasize something like your trade-off between the amount of compression achieved for tested accuracy in a much more straightforward way. But in sensitive domains, you may place more emphasis on uh, avoiding disparate harm. And so inevitably, it's almost like any other, uh, any other optimization process where you have a fixed budget and multiple criteria. How you distribute it between multiple criteria will depend upon the emphasis for that particular task. Um, and so Tiago rounds it off by saying there's no free lunch after all. Yes, indeed. I, that is the key takeaway of our work is that we can't treat these in isolation. We have to acknowledge that there's a, uh, a trade-off. Um, so we have, uh, let me see. Uh, so I have a question from Manny. Instead of training usually over parameterized models, uh, then pruning, isn't it preferable to train a small model and identify difficult data and cluster them into two branches? 
I completely, I think this is a very interesting direction. So there's a few, uh, in general, I, I think uh, a theme that I've tried to emphasize is that we're using a very crude tool right now to deal with uh, data, which is underrepresented. <laughs> we're throwing parameters at the problem. And in general, I find a very promising research directions, which are uh, thinking about how to treat the data itself differently or get early signals about what data the model is uncertain about to then intervene um, and use capacity in a more sensible way. So one is what Manny is talking about, which is this research direction, uh, thinking about cascading models as a variation of this. So if you have data which is um, uncertain in the first model, you pass it on to a second. So yes, I, I, I think this is a very interesting research direction. And I'll take one more because Jonathan, I, uh, knowing having attended his talks before, he I'm sure he's got something fantastic and I, I, I don't want to intrude on his time, but uh, there's, here's one from uh, Rajashi. Are you aware of any good principle theoretical approach to understand generalization performance with compression, maybe from a statistical pr perspective? So our work was really the first to date to, to articulate these trade-offs uh, in thinking be beyond just test set accuracy. And in fact, it spurred a lot of interesting conversations. And in particular, one aspect that is underexplored here, which I hope to see more work on, is the relationship explicitly with memorization. So uh, how does this relate to the, the work that has been done to date on good and bad memorization? So I'll leave it there, but thank you so much. This has been, uh, thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Sarah, for a great talk and answering all the questions we got on the chat. Uh, for everyone's knowledge, we also have a Slack for offline discussion, and we have a channel called Neural Net Model Compression. So please free, feel free to take it uh, away from there. Um, 